Hey, Psych Crew. Uh, Walls we're here with some more stuff for you. Hope you like the other stuff. Um, there's some really interesting, there are some really interesting studies with uh, the psychoactive drugs uh, that certainly the Johns Hopkins stuff we talked about is, is really good stuff. Um, and that's, that's sort of the non nefarious, uh, uh, work that's being done with psychoactive drugs, primarily psilocybin. Um, if you're interested in that topic, uh, obviously the, uh, I recommended the, um, Tom Wolf book, the electric Kool-Aid acid test. Um, there's, uh, there are a bunch of different, uh, books out there about, some of the really crazy stuff, like the military experiments with LSD um, and programs like MK Ultra, which is just the most bizarre stuff in the world. Um, secret experiments with LSD as a memory erasing and violence um, encouraging drug um, that the military and the CIA and this, you know, the CIA had this program and I just listened to this amazing podcast um, about um, the connection between the whole Manson family and the this MK Ultra program that the government was running that we know. I mean, they, there are a lot of different things with this with LSD that our military was doing for a long time. You can go online and you can you can look at the British military on YouTube dosed um, a bunch of their soldiers with LSD and sent them out into a field. And uh, just to see, you know, what they, the prospective uses for LSD as a possible um, military advantage. So, you know, that, that's where most of the first LSD stuff over here was done with the military. But take a look, this, there's this new book called Chaos <clears throat> by Tim O'Neill. And that's what I listened to the podcast about. And it deals expressly with the role of the government's MK Ultra program in testing LSD on uh, hapless sap hippies in the 60s. It's fascinating. So, um, you know, the, the, I'll tell you, the, the people that, like, you, you can never not be a conspiracy theorist because the government's track record is unbelievable. It's truly unbelievable. We, our government, you know, has sold crack to the inner cities. We have, we have used, you know, we have infected people with syphilis. That's not funny, by the way. None of this is funny intentionally to see how syphilis works. And we did that in Tuskegee. Um, we have uh, created programs like COINTEL Co and MKUltra, which were programs that were using psychoactive drugs on people who had no idea they were being exposed to psychoactive drugs. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, being a conspiracy theorist is the most rational. You should always assume conspiracy when the government's involved. Personal opinion, but I can substantiate that opinion with a million examples. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, uh, enjoy it. I mean, this, this is fascinating stuff. If, if you're in, if you are, we just finished a whole. I, I did two things on a bunch of things on the subconscious and the unconscious. Um, if you're interested in this stuff and you're interested in the psychoactive element, just read about it. There's tons of stuff out there on this. So we are moving into uh, motivation and emotion. Um, and I'm going to go through some of the, the, uh, the different 
theories regarding motivation and emotion. And then I'm going to get into, I want to get into the breakdown uh, element because that's a lot of, a lot of you guys and ladies love the, I don't love, but like the study of uh, issues of the psyche. And most issues of the psyche are really, you know, not that exciting. Um, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, but before that, we have to kind of talk about what makes us do things. Um, obviously, there's a biochemical uh, occurrence going on with motivation and emotion. Um, you have an amygdala, which is uh, the sort of emotional uh, component of the brain that kind of uh, sends out signals um, and, you know, things certainly that are related to the, the fight or flight response uh, of the nervous system. Um, so, and th that amygdala has the anger and uh, preparedness for something uh, harsh. So, um, how do we, when we take a look at emotion, how do we approach emotion? Well, there are uh, a couple things happening in, in the emotional process. You have an autonomic uh, surf, uh, the autonomic nervous system, which is activated uh, instantaneously when something comes about. You know, You'll, you know exactly what we're talking about. That hyper focus, instantaneous hyper focus, eh, that is your autonomic nervous system, and it is triggering eh, your sympathetic nervous system uh, to act. So the, the autonomic nervous system mobilizes your body. So let me give you an example. Um, a few years ago, my buddy and I are. Uh, we had just finished riding bikes. Uh, we were up in up in the high country outside of Boulder. We're coming down, and we have to come to a halting stop because a, a pretty large mountain lion is probably ten feet ahead of us on the road. It's just us two, and we stop. And, and of course, you know, immediately upon seeing that giant freaking cat and it was not that thing was not happy that we had stumbled upon it it was kind of giving us the the stare down the death stare and we're sitting there and right then you could feel that bam okay the ans autonomic nervous system has said okay mobilize mobilize now the sympathetic nervous system at that particular juncture is ready. You are staring at this animal and the sympathetic nervous system is ready. The adrenaline is pumping. Blood flow is being given to areas where it is needed. No need for digestion at that point. Blood flow is channeled to where it is needed. Sugar levels are uh, you know, changed. And this is where we start to see this sympathetic nervous system is what enables you to like lift a car off a child. Um, we are staring there. We are sitting there. We are looking at this thing, holding our bikes up over the head. And, uh, you know, I'm looking at my buddy and um, he's smaller than I am. And I'm like, oh, man, I wonder, will the cat pick him? For me, um, that's kind of what's going through my head. I'm kind of hoping the cat picks him, and then, I, of course, I'll help uh, with the situation. But this thing is just staring. So you are at a heightened level. The heart rate is increased. The heart rate has increased. Breathing, the respiratory system has increased, in including the heart rate has gone up significantly. Okay? This is all your sympathetic nervous system responding to your autonomic nervous system, or ANS and uh, SNS. So this is what's happening. And you can maintain that heightened state for a long period of time. And in fact, 
one of the things that kills people is the fact that that uh, the, that they are constantly in some like an abbreviated form of that um and it it uh this it's not good for you so anxiety creates that adrenal response which hardens the arteries and that's what kills you stress kills more people in this country than anything else um you know because that's it leads to heart attacks and strokes and so forth blood pressure elevation that's what the autonomic nervous or i'm sorry the sympathetic component of the nervous system is doing it is it is releasing this adrenaline now you have a parasympathetic nervous system so when that when that lion finally walked into the woods at that point the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in and relaxes the body now people who suffer from anxiety disorders that parasympathetic nervous system response i'm sorry man i'm i'm, I'm, ugh, I'm i can't even talk um, that parasympathetic nervous system response calms you. Someone with an anxiety disorder, okay, someone with an anxiety disorder gets stuck in that perpetual release of adrenaline, which affects the ability to sleep. Now, you'll notice, like after you have something like a almost a, a near car accident, you'll notice you're very tired after that. Uh, you, your body, your parasympathetic nervous system, you, you got jacked up okay, to prepare for battle. That's what this is. This is. These are all survival mechanisms. So you got jacked up to prepare for battle. And when there was no longer a perceived threat, Okay, your parasympathetic nervous system kicked in and backed you off and let you relax. And that will make you very tired because you're dealing with norepinephrine and epinephrine um, in, in this particular. Uh, and I think those are the, yeah, those are the ke chemicals that are released. And uh, your adrenaline glands are throwing stuff out there. And so... Um, you need to back off. This is this is a when your when your autonomic nervous system tells your sympathetic nervous system to activate, that is body preparedness for battle. Okay? The parasympathetic comes in and calms you down. That's that's really important to understanding emotion and emo, and uh, motivation and emotion, because so much of the stuff that we deal with. You know that fluttering heart uh, when you uh, when when someone comes up to you and says uh, so and so likes you. Okay, that heart flutters. That's nervousness. That's a nervous response. Like oh what oh my god, it's it's a happy nervous. But this is your nervous system. This is how it works, um, and that is a preparedness for survival. That's what we're dealing with here. So, with all of that said, we had, um, you know, three, re really four theories of emotion. And get, get ready for a, for a, a uh, screenshot because I have spent some time doing some quality work for you. There you go. There's the first part we're dealing with. These are the primary theories of emotion. And they go in order of discovery. Um, remember William James okay, from, from as one of the fathers, the first American psychologist, founder of the Harvard Psychology Department. Um, the James Lang theory of emotion. We have the Cannon Bard theory of emotion. We have the Schachter, Schachter Singer's first primary theory of emotion and then the Schachter Singer two-factor theory. And the only difference between these two uh, is the, uh, the, this one step here. And you'll notice my color coding that my wife actually took a picture of me doing today because she couldn't believe it, I think. 
So you have, you know, the only thing, the, the two fact, the only thing that's different between the two factor um, and the uh, original Schachter Singer theory is in this particular area, we have a reasoning step. And in this area, we have a cognitive labeling step. And they are almost, I, I really don't see much difference between these two theories. I usually just teach the two factor theory. I just figured I'd throw this one in there just because I was, it, it really made, it really adding that extra color kind of brought the chart together. So you take a picture of that and, um, this is Yerkes Dodson. And Yerkes, there it is. Yerkes Dodson is also going to be something uh, that we're going to talk about. So if you get a little screenshot there, hi, you get a little screenshot of Yerkes Dodson. Um, you get a screenshot of the, uh, the different theories of emotion. Now, the only theory that really is kind of kooky in these theories of emotion, oh my God, there's the dog. The only theory that's really kooky in this okay, is this James Lang theory. Okay? So when we're looking at uh, the James Lang theory of emotion okay it's i think the best way to explain it is it kind of puts the cart before the horse and what they what they believed was you had an event okay um and then I'm trying to think. So they believe that you had an event. Like, here's the best way to say it. We feel sorry eh, because we cry. Uh, angry because we punched somebody. Eh, or afraid because we were trembling. You see what I'm saying? Um, it, it's kind of, you know, you get this conscious awareness then um, then the physiological, then the emotional, which really doesn't make sense. It's kind of implausible. Okay? So, you know, you're kind of dealing with this, that our experience of emotion is sort of our awareness of our physical response. That's the James Lang theory. And... Um, it's it's kind of the only the only argument I've ever heard with the James Lang that I, I'm like, oh, say you're driving down the road and you a deer runs out and you're you uh, runs out in the road and you instinctively swerve and miss the deer and drive off. Okay? And then after you miss the deer, you feel the emotion that in that case, that makes sense that the emotional component is following your physical moving. You like how I'm driving is following your physical movement around the deer. But Cannon um, uh, and Bard were like, no, 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 because you don't need to, this was the, the best argument against James Lang theory is that you don't need a physical response to feel emotion. So you don't need to cry to feel uh, sorry. You don't need to punch someone to feel angry. So that, that was kind of the breakdown of that whole James Lang theory. Um, you know, like I said, Walter Cannon, who, uh, and I don't know who Bard is, uh, 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 I think he came later, or I, I'm not familiar with Bard. But these two guys believed um, that these two guys believed that the emotion okay, and the arousal went hand in hand. 
Okay. They believed that the emotion and the arousal went hand in hand. And that means that uh, when you, you're when you see the uh, mountain lion, what happens is the heart begins pounding simultaneously with the fear. Okay, the two react simultaneously. Okay? That's that's the cannon bar theory. Now, um, the you know what they're what they're saying is uh, you have to. One of the things that they're that they're saying is that you have to uh, perceive your body's arousal here um, simultaneously. That you these two things occur all at once. And it's a good theory. It's a good theory. You you know you see the mountain lion and bam. And so if we go back to James Lang when that thing we feel sorry because we cry, the Cannon Bard response to that would be no. You feel sorry and you cry at the same time. They are simultaneously. Schachter, Stanley Schachter, and Jerome Singer came up with. Uh, uh, this idea called the two factory, ugh, two factor theory. Okay? And we have, a, what they said was we have a physical arousal and then we create a cognitive label, okay? which is your brain says, okay, this is what's happening. Okay? And the experience of emotion grows from our body's feeling of arousal, okay? So in a sense, there's a, the, you know, when we look at Schachter Singer, we're kind of looking at the, um, the, a combination of Cannon Bard and uh, James Lang to some extent. Um, and, you know, so what we're looking at is the, to experience emotion, we must be physically aroused, and then we must cognitively label that physically physical arousal, and then we feel emotion. But the one thing about the two-factor theory um, that Schachter and Singer put forward is the it, it, it is all happening almost instantaneously. Um, but that whole cognitive label thing is very important to their theory that your brain marks it and says whether you should cry or punch or whatever it is. Um, emotion comes when we perceive our body's physiological, uh, you know, there's changes. So the, you know, you have your, your uh, visual cortex takes in a stimuli or you hear a stimuli that creates a physiological response in the brain. And it's a survival response. Now where the emotion comes, it depends, you know, like, like if eventually uh, when we take a look at some of these theories, um, it, it's, how you perceive. So let's say, for example, we go back to the mountain lion thing. And, and let's, let me just use this to kind of try and explain these different theories. So when we see the mountain lion, okay, I stop, I see the mountain lion. Okay, let's say okay, I immediately freaked out. Now, James Lang would say that I was scared because I freaked out. Okay? Cannon Bard would say that I was scared and freaked out at the same time. Okay? And then the two-factor theory would say okay, that I was scared I imprinted, I had a cognitive a label that said like, ooh, this is how you should respond and my heart started to race. That's the best way to 
take a look at this stuff from a, and, and for the record, um, you know, I don't, these, these, these types of, uh, th these theories of emotion are good. They're, they're helpful. Um, but they're, oh man, we're 25 minutes, but they're not the end all. So the, the next time I sit down with you, um, I'll, I will, uh, I will, I will talk about the Yerkes Dodson uh, rule law of arousal. And this is the, the Yerkes Dodson rule or law of arousal is actually really helpful for, um, for uh, understanding the uh, athletic performance or artistic performance, like playing guitar. So I'll, I will get into that. Um, I'm trying to think. I, for some reason, I I'm looking at my my chart. Um, let's see. Oh no, no, it's my chart's all good. I'll, my my James, my ugh, whatever, man. Look, hopefully you're taking a long walk with your dog, and you're listening to these, and you're learning a little something. And then uh, you go home and you say, wow, I might have learned a little something. Um, I'm trying to think of what the assignment I gave you for last, for this. I don't think I gave you an assignment for this class. I'll take a look. You know, my thing is going to be essentially one article per day. But I still want you listening and uh, to these when you walk the dog and learning a little something. Because that's what this this whole ridiculous COVID thing is. Um Anyway, uh, I look forward to maybe seeing you again when we, uh, if at, you know, I don't know, man, I don't know what they're doing with this stuff. Uh, I'm so, it's getting so silly. It really is. I mean, I, I don't mean to demean the whole people's lives and this, that, and the other thing, but as an economics teacher as well, this is just getting to the point where I'm like, come on. Anyway. I hope you're safe. I hope your families are safe. Um, you take care of yourselves. Walls.